hell are all y'all doing? I know it's been a little bit, but I would like to say, um, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. If you're into um, early, untold, um, ancient story of the lost stone age of America that's been suppressed by uh, modern academia, luckily it's slowly starting to loosen its, its bounds. But um, there is a plethora of ancient artifactual and different groups living way past that 13,000 or 15,000 year marker, 13,000 BC, where they say all oh, archaeology just magically stops. Well, it stops for a couple thousand years. And then you go down to layers around 17, 18,000 years, and it all picks back up again, mainly with these more diamond-like, um, uh, these more intricate, smaller, like, tools, um, uh, it's beautiful, and you see the artifact patina, the shine, from, from where it's been used and worn down, and you see that, that notch right there, I'm gonna put this down real quick, because my other hand's not free, let me make it free real quick, um, so, yeah, we already talked about the slew trains and their diamond, Diamond shaped, um, bifacially flaked, bifacially non flaked. If they're just uh, stamps that aren't finished yet, um, preforms, some people would call. But here is this example of this intricate Salutrine style knife. And you have this thumb notch that fits perfectly and this flat back so you can put pressure on the cutting end, which is right there. And we flip that around, same deal. Um, and a lot of times they pick these beautiful cuts of stone. Here's another example. You, um, you have the flat side and the pressure point where the actual cutting edge is. And this is a piece of very, very nice flint or smoky quartz. Um, but you can see the shaping and the chipping for these knives that, that come around the same, same layer and same time period. But today I was uh, shooting some um, film on location at the actual, um, one of my favorite places in the Pennypack, the start of the trail where Pennypack Road dead ends. Um, and that's a spot I'm extremely familiar with and where four of the sites are, where mostly all these artifacts have come from. And it's just slightly downstream from that crazy epic bank that I so eloquently titled, you know, the Beach of Hammers because of all these these crazy hammers that, you know, we find down there um, and all these different crazy metals. And, you know, that could be Ogham. You know, I had a video thinking that could have been more modern, but just don't know what those strikes are in that piece of quartz um, that is so uniquely shaped like a heart on the backside. Um, just big pieces of ore, um, giant hammer, but what I found today when I was shooting um, one of the main cuts, so um, it's not extremely accurate to call it a lost silver mine, more so a lost ancient quarries, let's say. And these quarries were pulling out great semi-precious types of stone, uh, clays that were really important, like paleogorskites, um, things with a lot of cinnabar and silver in them. Um, these, you know, mercury is in the area. This, this is a straight up piece of mercury, um, essentially. Uh, you know, and they would grind this cinnabar up and they would make pigments out of it, um, ochre out of it. Uh, but what I found today exploring, uh, and you'll see, you know, after I'm done talking, this will walk through here showing you what I found. It's going to cut into the actual on-site uh, video. Um, which is just really rough because just me walk around the woods with a phone. It's very jerky, um, shot from like just point of view because I think that's kind of neat. Um, I don't have somebody to follow me around and I'm not going to walk around the woods with one of those things strapped to me. I may in the future, if um, you know, certain things start taking off on the channel and people like certain things more than other things. But what I found is this amazing ancient piece of stoneware. And I'm always looking for pottery because the Paleo Woodland Indian of the Northeast just didn't make a lot of pottery. Not, not big stoneware makers. They made bowls of wood, um, gourds, things like that. They, they, uh, 
they did a lot of tapestry. They wove a lot of reeds and a lot of um, hill canes, things like that, to make baskets. They just didn't really need that the stoneware, or, you know, and they weren't firing it or, or, or doing that. It was a very Susquehanna thing. Now you can see the octagonal shape of the pottery in these three long, thick lines. And this is non-slip, but there's pigment on it. And oddly enough, we're getting this Mayan blue color again. Can't This camera's not the greatest, so... It's hard to get focus on, but you'll see it in pictures later. I have to clean this up. There's obviously some hieroglyphs on the outside of it of some sort, or drawings at least. Um, petroglyphs, I don't know. Uh, there's something in, in pigment there underneath. These little little tiny circles are like X's through them. And there's something drawn here. And then there's some dots and there's that Mayan blue and there's a a drawing an outline of something there and I have to clean this very carefully to remove all of this look it's so old that there's like a complex of moss growing on it and it takes hundreds of years uh, well at least 50 to 60 years for that moss to become like on that rock like that but um, it's non-slip inside but it definitely had some kind of coating on it not slip though. Uh, it's very old. This could be a thousand years old, two thousand. It could be proto Susquehannock. This could be a direct connection um, between some other people that were visiting from far off away on boats that we don't know anything about. Or this could be Susquehannock. It almost looks like there's a bow, a guy holding a bow. Looks like there's a mural on here, which would be absolutely amazing. Now, again, some people may say, hey, that's probably a funerary pot. I don't know because we don't entirely know all the customs and we don't entirely know if this is a Susquehanna pottery yet. This could be proto older and I believe it is older. Um, it's this lighter uh, stoneware, more of like a limestone. Um, this octagon, this would have been a big jug, almost the size of like a, a planter. Now it could very well be Susquehanna. Um, I found this it looks like a, a little stream that's coming out down from the hillside, down towards the creek. And I explain it in, you know, later on in this video. But it gets deeper and deeper. The walls get higher and higher. And you start realizing there's big piles or mounds that trees are growing out top of. The piles are rocks. Because what was going on is, is about the extent of their mining that they did. Um, they found a seam. A little stream was probably exploiting a seam of the silver rich agates, all the materials they wanted. And they started sh b digging this, this little creek out more and more. And it became almost like a canyon. It's almost like, sh like early strip mining. And you follow this creek all the way up. There's this crazy marker stone. And it's uh, made out of extremely solid, milky, white. It's pretty much a piece of slab of marble. Um, it, it's what one of these artifacts that I have over here was chipped off of because I found it nearby. But this was placed here as a marker. And uh, about another, I would say, 100 yards up or so, the creek splits around. It's a little island and it keeps going. You got to keep going and it bends around. And now you're getting off the property markers. The mine entrance that's collapsed. You can clearly see that this creek is coming out of that always has cold spring water. Um, this underground creek and there's eels in, in it so we know that the water's in there all the time um, and this black goo and mud that accumulates at the very end of that waterway is is obviously broken down silver um, it, it's one of the main access or collapsed access points to whatever subterranean type mining they're doing which I don't think was much because so much of the material they need was already in the meandering stream deposits and that's why there's huge quarry sites on the actual stream um, we see these like silver, rich silver or, you know, uh, Celts or, or hatchets. And, and this stuff was left more ceremonially. Um, and we, again, we see this, this worship of these, these deep pools of, of the water, um, of that, you know, native born stream that is born from the ground, um, at these deposits that are rich in all these materials, they're giving back. And it, it's not just one lineage of people, it's stuff from 
60 to 100,000 years. It's non-composite that, that, that was probably made by people that weren't even quite human yet. Some proto homeo species or, or sub lineal species that was running at the same time that either um, dissolved into us genetically or was just killed off or um, deeper into the Denisovian type stuff, uh, the North American Neanderthals type stuff, which is like this entire tray down here, which are all these primitive, just, you know, um, shaped chert tools, um, non-composite, meaning they're just hand tools. You see things like this with the, with the black pitch and patina still on it. It's this strange type of, they believe it's a, a stone napping type tool, but they find this a lot in Neanderthal sites, the same type of tool here. Find a ton of them in that chert layer. Um, a layer that I date at 60,000 to 100,000 just because I already hear enough crap about saying how old stuff is. I really think it's much older because it's very reminiscent to tools found in Africa that are 500,000 to a million years old. Um, but archaeology does not want to come to grips with there being any kind of human ancestor, human life form at all on the continent of North America, which is absolutely absurd. It's one of the largest land masses. Its climate was temporal uh, on the same hemisphere to most of Africa. Um, why wouldn't there be species of hominid here too? And what happened is whenever that disaster hit, our memory was wiped out. We, we rebooted everything. And the, the civilization and life pretty much had to be restarted from parts of Africa and the Middle East where there were some people left. Probably because it was further away from the epicenter of the crazy disaster that did happen. A disaster that so thoroughly wiped out our memory and our consciousness that we only go back to that marker and, and we stop. Because all the stuff, you know, you go back 13, 13 and a half thousand years, you find this Clovis stuff. So they someone coined a term Clovis culture because they found the first artifact that resembled this shafting technology in Clovis, New Mexico. Meanwhile, we find them all over the place that they're dispersed. And in these sites, there's rich Clovis activity, but they're recycled points from an older thing. They're just picking up a very triangular point, fluting it to fit their shafting technology because they're recycling stuff that was left in these ancient quarries before them. The depositing of stuff at these deep holes, I and mean, that's a very ancient Druidic and Celtic practice. It, it, ancient, you know, Bronze Age and, and, and Meso, um, Lithic period um, type, type stuff. And eventually it was readapted, you know, and eventually ended up, making its way all the way into Christianity as baptism, but there's been some form of belief, um, whether it well be pagan, worshiping gods of individual things like the gods of, of stone. And you start seeing these really intricate scrapers, like, like I said, the turtle, this is like a turtle FUG scraper here. You see the artifact patina on it. Um, but I am just absolutely blown away by this piece. And I got to clean this very carefully, um, figure out with what, and uh, see if I can pull out any of these amazing uh, remnants of glyphs and um, any kind of writing on it, because that's evidence. The pot itself is evidence, um, and some of the best I have, because you can see the extent of the pottery that I have in my collection is not very much after 15 years. I got another newer funerary piece here that's Sesquihano because you can still see some of the design and the coloring on it but this is at a time period when they had slipware this is a, a salt glaze that is on here so you're you're talking probably 10 1000 AD 1100 whereas something like this is more reminiscent of something that's about 2000 years old you know well into the paleo woodland Paleo Indian period. Um, and then there's stuff like this that is clearly Mayan blue. And um, yeah, we're going to um, really keep digging deeper into this freaking wormhole. It, this is what I call a um, glitch in the archaeological matrix where you're seeing 
pretty much a timeline of existing activity, quarrying, farming, woodworking, clothing manufacturing, stone uh, exploitation of the resources for an extremely long time by many different groups of people with different types of artifact making. Um, older tools like that, like that hand axe there. Um, that looks more Salutrian, by the way, the shape. So do these, these look very Salutrian in shape. These little tiny saws and little, you know, fishing implements and chisels and files. Um, so awesome, awesome stuff. And I'm going to have a whole video on this once it gets cleaned up, but this is just astonishing. And I'm going to go back to that site soon and see if I can find more of this to try to put this whole pot together because it's like a half a million dollar piece in all honesty they're so rare finding any kind of pottery from this time period in Pennsylvania especially and then we can it gives you a lot more clues to who they were like they were Iroquois but that was just kind of their language their practices of Susquehannock were very very different and the proto Susquehannock who knows um starting to see a lot of Cahota and definitely Mississippian in, in, in their, their pottery style. Um, that's just a massive vessel right there. Um, wouldn't it be crazy if we wash it off as some Bronze Age piece of pottery, <laughs> like Phoenician or something. But nothing would surprise me at this point um, because we can call it forbidden archaeology or unaccepted archaeology or... We're talking about like a, a small little town in you know southeastern PA, um, Willow Grove to be specifically. Um, you're talking about a creek that flows through a metropolitan into into a huge city, the city of Philadelphia, eventually emptying into the Delaware. And you can go to any one of the banks in my area that's covered in rocks and find this stuff by the thousands. The amounts of activity there had to be, some kind of city, some kind of living center, some kind of inhabitation zone, and we, we, can, we can look at the anthropological records to know when it wasn't, because the earliest people that were here, late 1500s, that were writing stuff down said, uh, and all the way up through the colonial period, the Native Americans didn't live around that creek anywhere. They had no known actual settlements. They uh, stayed there periodically, seasonally, um, for hunting and fishing purposes. So we know at by that time period that those Susquehannocks, they were either, we know that they they worked with silver and had access to these mines because they're the ones that told the stories to the first fur trappers and, and showed them the locations. Now they're not going to just um, give away their secret mine location or their quarry sites um, because they need it to protect these in order to maintain the trade for guns and cannons and, and things from the Europeans because the Susquehannock were not allegiance to the Iroquois or the Delaware tribes. They were on to their own. They were hated from all sides and they were a powerhouse um, controlling the beaver fur trades and Indian pewter or Indian silver. You can see more metals and stuff like that coming out of this area. Now, um, they didn't have any settlements or stockaded fortress dwellings at that time period because the Swedes started to settle along the creek. Um, now we have heard of some attacks and butcherings by different groups on people, but there was so many different conflicts going all over, different tribal conflicts. And of course, this area has all this splendid wealth and resource is going to be protected. But we're, we're, you know, we find a fossilized bone that is stained in ochre. You know, it's like the end of, of a, you know, of a joint or you know, something and then you could see the, the actual marrows, the pores in the marrow, but this is solid stone now. And another piece, this is probably part of like a vertebrae or something like that. But you have to ask yourself, you know, it's gonna take at least 10,000, 12,000 years for that bone to become stone. Um, different geological conditions can change that. You know, some will argue that in certain conditions, a bone can fossilize in a thousand years. Um, but not in those conditions back there. But anyway, um, I hope you enjoy. I know I haven't posted in a while. Life's been crazy. 
um, as usual, very busy, just trying to survive, making ends meet. Um, please spread the word if you're interested in this stuff or find similar stuff. I'm not very good at um, reading tons of comments and getting back to them. I try to um, as much as possible. Um, I have uh, a little bit of change in career paths lately, so I might have a little bit more time to get back to people and focus on this stuff a little bit. But um, anyways, uh, checking out. I love y'all. Um, stay happy. Um, stay lost. Stay true to yourself. Um, get out there. Have adventures. Find find crazy things that are under our feet. Um, all those lost treasures in our backyards, pretty much. I mean, this is Pennsylvania we're talking about. All this stuff in just a few little deposits. You know, and we get stuff that looks almost like European boat building tolls, but made in stone. <laughs> you know, there could have been some groups between a hundred and a thousand Celtic groups. It's probably definitely a large Celtic settlement on the East Coast. And I say this because... I mentioned all those crazy stone structures and dolums and, and stone circles and uh, ritual sites all up the northeast of the United States. And they, they have no idea. They know that they're older than the Native Americans oral tradition because the oral tradition says the some say there's moon eyed giants that uh, came out at night that, that lived in these forts on the hill, which sound a lot like, um, you know, Bronze Age and um getting into the Iron Age of Europe where they had these hill forts and uh, the Irish, uh, oddly enough, when I did that video on the Wissahickon of the Olgum, and we might have another example of Olgum on that, it means to strike into stone with metal. And that's a good example of that right there. Um, we may, uh, as there's evidence uh, in the Arkansas River, um, some Mithraic group and it, all up in, uh, I guess, Connecticut where the United States Stonehenge is, um, there's this evidence of a Celtic group, and it gets deeper. I think the name was the Dorum, or the Duma tribe of North and South Carolina, spoke only um, uh, an ancient form of Welsh, and um, domesticated deer. Now, this is very, very curious to me. They um, didn't domesticate cattle, because where they were, they had tons of deer. And they got so good at making deer milk, creating cheese, herding the deer. And they would do this by creating these long rock walls to channel the migration of deer um, over and over again to, to domesticate these animals. And I think a lot of what you're seeing, these crazy rock walls, these pens, these things, they're for the domestication of deer. And we don't really think of that, but that's a, a an ancient Celtic practice. It's even in their ancient songs. And, their, um, and uh, the Mandan tribe, uh, blonde hair, blue eyed tribe that had facial hair that made round little circular boats instead of canoes. I forget the actual name of those boats in, in Welsh, forgive me. but uh, So they were definitely over here. The stories of the Vikings, even from the Vinland saga, when they talk to the Skraling and they communicate to the Skraling and the interaction says, oh, you're not the first people that look like you that were here. They've been here for hundreds of years. And they were talking about Druids, these priestly people that came over and spread wisdom. They even run into one uh, in the stories of, um, what's the Spanish explorer? One of the first ones that explored the Mississippi Valley area uh, up through the, uh, landed in um, Alabama, Mobile Bay. Um, Doseca, or do, I forget it. The Spanish explorer, um, I have one of his videos posted in the playlist um, of the descriptions of how horrible, like, you know, America was at the time. And when they landed, it was probably like in the 12s or 1300s, I would have, maybe 1400s. This is right after this devastation happened to Gahota, where that whole complex collapsed over something. It was probably caused by volcanic activity blocking out the sun. There was an entire decade, there, there was no sun even across Europe. It was you know, reported the Dark Ages are bad for written information. That's why they're called the Dark Ages. But just some food for thought um, that there, uh, these stories are in every Native American um, uh, 
oral folklore, the stories of the cannibals in the hills or, you know, the albino cannibals of the hills. I mean, these people that had these hill forts, um, these bearded men, some were described as being giant. The Cherokee call them the moon-eyed people. They worshipped at night, apparently. Um, they wiped these people out because they couldn't see during the day. They had problems with their eyes, apparently, or so says the legend, but, but who really knows? Maybe there was just a a group of Celts um, doing what Celts do, building hill forts, building things out of stone, um, worshipping deep pools of water. Um, maybe they had a stronghold on the East Coast before the migration of the natives from the West Coast caught up and got all the way over here. Maybe there's some ancient seafarers, thousands of years coming over here from... Um, that direction and it is not out of the question at all i believe 18 19 thousand years ago salutrians made it over here so uh, sea levels were way lower ice sheets were way further down uh, the ocean wasn't as big of a deal to navigate because you could pretty much walk across it and get over here following the seals find these pieces of art that are very very seal like in appearance and the relief the fin the head it could also be a bird it could be a wing it's a lot of like silvers and gold running through that piece there so sparkly sparkly but anyways i'll look up another neanderthal type tool you'll put that right next to the other one i mean talk about pattern of, of efficacy over and over again in the tool making and that's ancient it's like sixty thousand years old that's what tools look like that there's patina on it still. Look, guys, this is crazy. We have to look deeper. Um, the entire um, archaeological record after 13,000 years needs to be rewritten in America because it hasn't been explored at all. It's just been denied and suppressed. Hopefully, um, you know, you watch podcasts like um, there's people out there like Graham Hancock, um, who's been preaching um, much ancient, older civilization that we can't remember because we have like an amnesia from this ca catastrophic event. And back when he started preaching this stuff, no one wanted to take him seriously because couldn't back it up um, in the geological record. But that's where his buddy uh, comes along. Um, and God, Randall um, Carlson, yeah, um, this amazing uh, geological mind and, and looks at things with a new perception pretty much um and through ice core samples we know that there was a crazy impact event 13 14 thousand years ago it probably happened somewhere over canada area near oregon and it's probably three impacts from comets all in the same period of time melted the ice sheets instantly catastrophic flood wiped out the entire continent of america essentially and everything on it um and everything got restarted that's why everything disappeared. It disappeared for like three, 4,000 years. It's not a small gap. It's why they thought there was no people here after 13,000 years because they dug down another 500, didn't see anything, another 1,000, okay. Nothing, another 1,000, nothing, okay. Then obviously there's this barren in the period of Younger Darius that, that followed afterwards. Um, but it just so completely annihilated everything. Uh, I'll say goodbye again because I go off on tangents, but that's just the ADHD. I love you all, and um, please subscribe. Um, take care. Share. Get over this. This is kind of just a walkthrough, a little filler footage of Kind of the area I deal with, just so you can see. All right, I'm gonna, head back to the bench. All right, I'm, I'm gonna turn around in a second. <laughs> I will. I'm not. I'm gonna head back soon. Okay. I'm getting too. Bu there's too many bugs from all the rain. They're everywhere. Yep. It's a very very buggy day, but I kind of just wanted to give you an ambiance of the area. 
and just all the crazy amounts of old growth trees and how primordial you feel even though it's you know, 20 minutes from all modern civilization about 30 minutes from Philly but unfortunately we had tons of rain yesterday uh, overnight so and we're getting into June now so with it being June we've got tons of mosquitoes and sex bugs all that kind of shit um, and as you walk through these um, old trails creek to the left high ground to the right this constant flow of spring water coming out of the caverns and different mining entrances um, and there's almost this weird mound built back in there it's almost impossible to get to when the forest is this in bloom and this thick um, but we're not too far from uh, the uh, room or pebble beach entrance point and these will be like sub trails off of your um, off your main trail um, but it's sort of like a temperate rainforest back here it's just like a little piece of time history that is preserved and completely left the way it was and um, why I usually say I like to artifact hunt in the fall it's just because of how thick um, everything gets in the northeast in the summer and you can't see certain things anymore because it's just covered by green That was a deer antler, but not a deer antler. Just a stick. But mainly, if you get towards the creek and on the other side, it's all swamp. It's a very, very hard um, place to sustain any kind of um, living environment, such as a village. And, the areas along this creek were exploited and used, but they lived a ways that way, up into the hills, away from the flooding, away from the uncomfortability that this area presents floodplain-wise, but in the same sense, you have an extremely rich area with natural resource. Extremely rich. And you can see this giant tree here, up here, this is the pathway to the mine. One of the cave mine entrances anyway. And this giant, massive tree that you can get some kind of realization of it. I don't know, but you're looking at some massive, 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 massive trees and you can just see some of these monsters emerge But what happens is, this path curls around and meets another one that you can pick up by that big tree. And it runs way up about two miles, which I'm not doing that hike today because you start getting off of parkland and I don't want to trespass. Not these day, not this day and age, everyone got a gun, so. Um, but this path will curl around over here. You can see the runoff, the channels from their operation coming down through here washing a lot of the stuff you find in the creek into the creek um, but um, yeah it's uh it's a bit crazy um, 
And it took me years and years piecing it all together to figure out what was going on and, and researching the anthropology. And you can see you got another tree that was intentionally twisted at some point. And I use these kind of clues, these markers, to, to find where they're doing their stuff. Another thing is uh, a lot of the uh, operation isn't really mining, it's more of a quarrying. So these veins are exposed by the creek and they just don't have to dig holes. They can just quarry what they need right out of the creek. Um, which is why you see these giant quarry sites. And the trail just continues down to the water. Yeah. But the main, the main thing uh, that really led to the discovery of that mining operation, you see that deposit on the other side of the creek there. Um, extremely rich deposit over there for artifacts. You see all the, the rocks over there on the beach? I think that's where you're gonna find tons of stuff. It's gonna be washing down from the mining operation over here. Um, and we'll really get to see a cut in a second. We'll see where it's been dug out. And here it is. You get this other trail right here and it's pretty clear. You can see it going through the tree line up there. I can walk on it a little bit. See all the deer tracks. I would say follow down here, this whole bank start getting higher and dug out more and more and more as you continually go up. And get higher and higher into this cut and it's washing all this material down. That's water, ice cold, it's coming out of the ground. I followed it all the way back to its origin and found the caved in mine entrance where they were actually exploiting either a cave or they were doing some underground type stuff. It's an old piece of rubber shoe. I don't really like finding that kind of stuff out here. see a lot of uh, worked stone around the base of this tree. Uh, chestnuts. Beech nuts. Now I'm going to go up too much further just to show you how deep the walls start to get over here. This is all dug out. This is exploiting the agate, you can see an artifact right on the ground over there if I zoom in from here. See, you can see a hammer. Stuff right over there. And that's what a lot of artifact hunting is. But you can see how these cuts, look at this cut here. How this cut comes down. This has been cut out. Intentionally cut. And the material has been removed. You can see it, it's like a goalie. It starts up there, runs down, runs down. Then you get into all of the mine. As you go up this canyon, it gets deeper and deeper, the walls. And there's another, another cut right there that comes down. Get all this material. And if you keep following the path up the high ground, you'll come to a place where there's a distinct island. And if I had my guesses, that would be where you would want to fucking start looking. Uh, for anything buried by the Knights of the Golden Temple back here. What is that? Is that a bone I just saw? The bones are important to me. I just saw it could have been a leaf or a pot or something. But it's starting to open up now, and you can see how high these canyon walls start to get down into this little creek bed, this little channel, and you start seeing all the artifactual material. The big hammer stones and the, and the rocks. And we can try to get down in here. 
But if I follow this natural cut, not natural, but it was natural, but then dug out. This has all been dug out. This isn't naturally geologically. And dug out to get water to move stuff from the, the mining operation. So, a little too many bees back here. I'll move. My bad about that. Got attacked really bad back here by bees about four years back by ground hornets. So, not really in the mood for that. I kind of just wanted to take you like a quarter of the way up that cut just so you could get an idea of where and how to read the land and the geology kind of take you to something oh. get out of there too many insects today too many deer I want the bugs these bees And you see all this black mud, you know, forming up down here in this stuff here. This little muck and, and dark, dark stuff. What you're seeing is silver essentially being stripped out of the rock, building up down here. Oh, there's some mushrooms, huh? Guy right there. It's like a russet, but it's grown off of a wood. It could be a wood tuff. Don't trust the mushrooms to grow off a of wood. The uh, tip. But you can really start seeing some of the archaeological evidence. This is discard piles. This, this pile of rock up here has been removed and piled up. It's a discard pile. Either from when they made the road or from when they were moving stones pulling them out of here piling them back up onto the bank you know. they find a lot of little cool little artifacts down here too this isn't like uh, artifact central There's a lot of stuff down here Dirt. Yeah. This is where you're gonna find silver and gold back here. <laughs> if there is any, right? And there definitely is. And you find all kinds of arrowheads. <laughs> Not very hard. You don't have to be here long. They're in a lot of places back here, but yeah, you never know what you're gonna find up in up in here. You get a ton of artifact from here being pushed and washed down into the creek down there. So I am. Um, to see it all. Sorry, good stuff that looks more silver related. Bad, no. Not bad at all. It's fine stuff. I don't want to really dig. I don't want to preservation. But it's kind of showing you how much material that this synthetic cut that has been pretty much created out of out of the creek that was already here. But I mean, you just see so much evidence of stone tool work and actual stone tools that is pretty fucking crazy um, 
It's here like 10 minutes. Let me see all the silver build up, all the muck, all the mire build up from this cotton and that goes all the way back and the walls start getting higher and higher. And this is flowing out of the collapsed mine entrance, all this material. So, and I found some of my best, most detailed finds back amongst this. Um, this cut back up in here. But it is, like I said, something that I enjoy coming back in the fall to do. I'm going to explore up it that way. It's, it's too thick. And I'm by myself, so it's another thing. You know. You see a hammer here, possibly. It could be just a rock or a place stone, but still, this whole pile of rock and stone, some artifactual up there, possibly. Hmm. <sighs> Too many spider webs, dude. Yeah, a big discard pile right here. That's what we'd be looking for. Oh. Wow, that is a significant find right there. Holy shit. This is ancient Susquehannock stoneware right up by this silver site. It's like an octagon piece of hot this is insane this might be is that mayan blue on the back this could be a discovery of the ages this has made my whole day dude finding a piece of pottery this big intact ancient stoneware are you kidding me look at that that is crazy and the context in which it was found oh another piece <laughs> It was found in this rock pile. And I mean, this could be a, a funerary pot that got broken and dug up. <sighs> wow. That is, uh, that is something. I got two pieces of this crazy old pot. Non-slip. Oh. This could be a year, thousand, two thousand years old. This piece of pottery. Oh. Now I'm gonna make my way out of uh, a part of the Penny Pack Preserve. One of my favorite places of it actually the place closest to where I actually live it was about four minutes from my actual home I could walk to my house from here in about 19 20 minutes if I just start going that way for a while but, um, so it, it is really just a sliver of this ancient ancient world preserved so, anyway love you all happy lost souls checking out stay safe Stay adventurous.